Okay, let's get going, guys. Um, so welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining our webinar today, where we'll be looking at uh, transitioning from a TM1 environment to Anoplan and sharing some of um, our background, our decision making, and, and our transition from, from TM1 to Anoplan. My name is Carl Doyle, and, and I'll host today's session. I'm also joined by Chris Minnett, who is a solutions co consultant at, at Bedford and all around Anoplan wizard. Uh, Chris will be taking you through the live demonstration of, of Anoplan for Finance um, shortly. Okay, firstly, just to introduce you all to what we're going to cover today um, and then try and give some, some rough timings. So first thing we're going to do is just give a bit of a, a background on ourselves, Bedford, and on our journey from TM1 to, to Anoplan, uh, and then look at some of the reasons behind those decisions. The key differentiators between TM1 and Anoplan. Chris will cover the Anoplan demonstration for finance, and then we'll come back for a Anoplan honeycomb, uh, where outside of finance might we be able to to use Anoplan or look to Anoplan to give us business support, and then we'll we'll take any uh, Q and A uh, from the crowd as we as we go through. Okay, we're going to spend, I'm going to take you through the, the first part of the agenda in about 20 minutes, and then Chris is going to cover the Anaplan demonstration in about 35 minutes, so plenty of time in, in the product, and then we'll leave five minutes for, for Q&A. First of all, I guess just a little bit about on our background. So uh, for those of you who don't know Bever Consulting, uh, we are an exclusively Anaplan partner and have been since 2016. Prior to that, uh, we were founded actually out of the IBM corporate management suite, so typically Cognos Planning, which then uh, turned into uh, TM1. So from 2008 to uh, 2016, uh, we were IBM partners. We delivered uh, TM1 projects day in, day out. Uh, we came across uh, Anaplan um, back in 2011, loved what we saw, uh, and ultimately spent five years running down our, our TM1 business and, and ramping up our, our Anaplan business. And I'll, I'll speak to some of the decisions around why we did that. Personally, uh, I was in those trenches uh, from 2008 onwards. I was uh, delivering uh, TM1 projects, very familiar with, with some of the, the core tool sets. Um, so hopefully I can, I can speak to, to some of that as we go through the today's session. Okay, I guess first of all, who is this webinar for? What what information can you get out of it? So I guess it's really for those of you who are running on an unsupported TM1 version. Okay, 10.2.2 has been unsupported since uh, September of last year, uh, and you're probably wondering, you know, can I can how long how long how much longer can I continue on this road, um, and and do I need to do something about it? And if so, uh, where can I go? Um, and we we'll, we are promoting on a plan as your your next step on on that journey. I guess one thing to, to get up front, this is not a slagging match against TM1. It's really just an honest account of, of our decision making, the reasons behind it, uh, and how we actually went about our, our transition to hopefully support you in, in terms of what and how you might um, do the same. Okay, Our business was founded off TM1 all those years ago. We had many successful years, uh, so by no means uh, do we want to be uh, whipping them. Um, it's just really an honest account of, of our journey to date. Okay, so first of all, I guess, a little bit about our decision-making. So why we chose to transition our business strategy away from TM1 and focus in, entirely on, on Anapan. To be honest, there was quite a few elements to it. I guess the biggest one is uh, we didn't really want to be what we call techies. Okay, so really what we mean by that is we wanted to be more focused on the business. We wanted to be... Uh, working with the business to solve their problems rather than spending 95, 98% of our time uh, in rules, in TI processes, in keeping servers uh, live and um, you know all the configuration that comes around at that time with local installations. Uh, so really, we wanted to move our knowledge base and move our, our business strategy away from hard technical skills and focus um, more on, yes, technology, but also um, solving business problems and, and speaking to our, our customers. I guess one of the things we saw and the opportunities we saw with Anaplan was it was a, perp even back in 2011, it was a purpose-built single true cloud deployment. Okay, so I'll come on to talk a bit more about maybe some of your landscapes within TM1, but ultimately within Anaplan, 
it was a single platform, you know, across finance, across HR, across supply. We were able to um, build all of our solution out in Anapan. We were able to build our dashboards. You know, there was nothing we had to do around uh, keeping servers up or configurations or fix packs. All that good stuff was was taken care of. So Anaplan strategy was was very much purpose built EPM performance. I mentioned it already, but we all of our TM1 uh, engagements, and, and I know some of you might have other use cases within TM1, um, but ultimately all of our project work uh, in those early days was around finance, okay? And, and traditionally that Cognos planning and TM1 suite was was heavily focused on on finance. Whereas what, with Anaplan, we saw the opportunity to uh, connect a lot of different dots within an organization, within EPM, across finance, across sales, across HR, across marketing, supply and operations with the same tool set. So not having to learn one skill for finance, another skill for marketing, another skill for supply chain. This was the same technology, same calculation functions, same look and feel across all of those uh, different product bases. We also wanted to deliver in an agile way. So back then we sold six month, 12 month, 18 month projects. You know, was, they were big engagements that we sold. And ultimately it was very hard for a customer to see the back end of us. So our business model was, was very different. It was land in, deliver a successful project and support. Whereas with Anaplan, ultimately it's very quick uh, and it's, it's much quicker um, speed to delivery times. So we're talking in, in weeks rather than months. Um, and the agile methodology that we, we deliver our projects with now is called called the Anplan way. So ultimately we land in, we deliver a successful project and we enable the customer to support uh, that solution for, for a longer term. And then ultimately we look at other use cases within the company and, and spend our time um, evolving the solution into, into those different areas. So very different business model. I guess the excitement at the time for us, this was 2011, um, cloud, to be honest, was still a bit of a to-do subject when we first got involved with Anaplan. So it did take us five years to really transition from a ramp down of TM1 and a run up of, of Anaplan, but we were committed to that journey. And I guess all of the reasons I've already stated were, were key to that, but ultimately there was just a huge buzz around Anaplan and there was starting to be a huge buzz around true cloud. Um, and it was massive uh, continued investment into the product roadmap of Anaplan uh, through those early years and there, there still is and they had a very clear focus in terms of what they were what they were doing which was slightly different to what we were seeing from from IBM uh, we started to see uh, the, the, that are already started to divest in, in areas like uh, CDM or Cognizant Insight and, and those kind of technologies so Anaplan was a very clear message very clear focus um, and it was massive investment going in uh, so it was massively appealing to us. The other thing I think uh, internally was it was a very different change in our profile of of consulting. Um, so our, our skill up time was was re weeks rather than than months. And at that time we had some of the top TM1 guys around. So back in 2011, 12, 13, we had a job on our hands to to pull them away from TM1 and say, look guys, uh, our strategy here is is on a plan. And ultimately, the Anaplan was at the early stages of its development. It's not the product that is it is today by by any means, but we could see the potential in it. Um, so those guys, ultimately, we had to tear our TM1 away from them at the time. But if you ask any of them who are still with us, and, and the majority of our core TM1 team are now Anaplaners. Uh, for anyone who, who knows us, you'll know the likes of Gary Murphy, John Smith, Andre Pretorius. Um, Paresh Kiroi, you know, they were core to to those TM1 days and now they're core to the Anaplan uh, system as well. But even they would admit now that we're, we're light years ahead of, of where we were back then. And our, our team profile is very different. We don't look for techies. We look for uh, analysts. We look for or uh, business partners that we can bring in, skill up in, in a matter of weeks. And then ultimately um, they can be delivering on a plan sol solutions mo much quicker than what we could in, in TM1. And that goes uh, hand in hand with internal enablement. If we're skilling people up in weeks, you have the ability to skill people up in, in weeks also. So massively different RAM profile in terms of the resources required to support on a plan versus TM1. Okay. And I put this in here and it kind of, you know, it, it sounds a bit uh, soft sometimes, but we really wanted to put the customer at the center of, of what we did. So we always, although we deliver very successful projects and, and we build great referenceability in, in our team one days, obviously, and, and that was the core of our business. We very, we found it difficult to put smiles on people's faces, you know, after a long delivery, 
uh, we've been through the trenches, we've delivered the scope that we, we said we would deliver, um, and, and you've got it in your team one solution. You know, we all came out the ba back of those projects, battle-worn, and, and there's very few smiles coming at the back end of those projects, even though we've delivered on budget what we said we would deliver. Whereas with Anaplan, I feel we can do that. You know, the, the time to value is is much quicker. Uh, we can actually put smiles on people's faces, and the majority of the time, people are surprised by what can be achieved with Anaplan rather than uh, the other way around. So there are some of the key reasons. Again, I could go on and on and on, but I just wanted to kind of bring to light for you uh, what were our uh, decision-making criteria when we looked at, at migrating our business away all those all those many years ago. And now they are still uh, the decisions that ring true and, and we've never looked back on, on that decision. In terms of key differentiators, so I've picked out five. Again, I could, I could, like, this is not an exhaustive list. I could sit here all day and, and talk about it. But ultimately, I wanted to pick out five of the core differentiators between a, a team one environment and, a, and an Anaplan environment. So I guess the first one for me is it can truly be a business owned solution. Okay. It has a familiar business language. It's got very uh, close look and feel to a spreadsheet in terms of the calculations, the lookups, the max, the mins, the lengths, uh, the lefts, the rights, etc. You know, the, the, the people you're, you're grabbing are ultimately um, people from spreadsheet worlds, from business worlds, from analyst worlds, rather than heavy techie, heavy IT background. Uh, which what which is what we saw more so of in in TM1. So that goes hand in hand with the learning curve. So naturally, if you are uh, the process expert coming from the spreadsheet, you have the ability to transition across to Anaplan much 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 quicker than you do to TM1. You know, if I showed a business owner who who owns the previous FP&A processes in Excel, TM1. Uh, they'd go, Jesus, I don't want to be a systems person. Whereas if I show them on a plan, I can kind of marry the business side of it with the uh, technology side of it. So it's a much quicker uh, learning curve. Again, on a plan was a single cloud platform. Okay. Everybody is on the same upgrade path. There's no fixed packs, 10.2.1 point, whatever it is, uh, which was ultimately the, the vein of our lives. So when I talk about us not wanting to be techies, um, that was one of the main reasons, you know, you install this latest fix pack onto environment A and it's totally different to environment B at customer B and it, f it fixes the problems you, you might have had, but it also maybe creates five other problems. So that was a massive bugbear in, in our world. No firewalls, no log files, no dot uh, config files that, that need to be looked after. So a single cloud platform uh, with all of that pain of, of, of hardware and, and servers looked after uh, for us by, by, by Anaplan. So I took that away from uh, our responsibility, which was, was massive and, and will be massive for, for you guys and, and have a massive uh, cost saving associated to it also. Connect the planning. I think I've already talked about this, but you know, uh, Team One traditionally is a, a finance um, solution. I know some of you, and and I, 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 I try not to hamstring it into a, a pure finance world, but because uh, I know some people will be using it for sales or, or supply or, or shaping it in different directions. But ultimately, Anaplan truly enables connected planning. So on the same platform, on the same code structure, on the same calculation logic, look and feel, user experience, you can touch finance, you can touch sales, you can touch HR, you can touch supply chain, and you can touch operations. Okay, um, And that is something I think is unrivaled. Uh, out there in terms of technology is on a single platform being able to touch all of those different use cases, connect all of the dots and control the, the ebb and flow between each of those different points is something I believe Anaplan is standalone out there on the on the market for, for connected planning. Okay, final one I think is a single clean and simple user experience. So I'll come on to a, a follow-up slide in a moment. Um, but ultimately, Anaplan is, is very clean. We build in, in, in one place, we, we design in one place, we push the production in one place. Um, I don't have multiple tool sets uh, for, for development, for deployment, for look and feel. We have a single clean and simple user experience, which for me is, is massive. Can hopefully sum that up for you here by by trying to just bring to life an indicative TM1 landscape. I'm not saying every TM1 landscape uh, looks like this, but a lot of them will. 
versus a, a one cloud planning platform in, in Anoplan. So if you look at the TM1 landscape, again, one of the, the technology reasons we moved away in terms of the profile of, of people we had internally was we were dealing with so many different tools. So within a, a single landscape, naturally you have to look after the TM1 server. You could be doing your building and performance model or in TM1 architect. Am I using TM1 contributor to, to generate my, my workflow? Uh, am I pushing that then to TM1 web? Am I pushing it to perspectives, to Excel, to CAFE, to Cognos Analytics? Um, so, you know, how, who did I want to consume this data? What was the best place for them to consume that data? And ultimately, I needed to be the expert in all of these different tool sets, uh, which became more challenging as, as IBM continued to, to maybe add tool sets um, on the end of, of the TM1 set. Okay, Turbo Integrator, again, another classic one in there. We also had to be experts in uh, running TIs, writing TIs, uh, connecting data sets from, from different areas of, uh, of upstream and, and downstream sources, which for those of you who are familiar with it, is, is a rather technical uh, function. Okay, to what we have in our plan, again, I've mentioned it a couple of times uh, now, but a single tenanted uh, cloud-based technology, uh, which could be owned by the, the business. And then if we wanted to push stuff out of it, we could use PowerPoint add-ins, Excel add-ins, PDF add-ins, but ultimately 98% uh, of our, our work is done in that uh, cloud, which uh, Chris will, will demonstrate in a few moments. Okay, before I hand over to Chris in, in three minutes, I'm just going to um, just talk about, for those of you who are deep in the TM1 world, I thought it might be just be useful for you to start to bridge the gap between TM1 um, definitions and our plan definitions. And because there are a lot of similarities, we've, we've moved on and we've progressed a lot since, since the early days of, uh, of TM1, which was Table Manager 1 and, and prior to that, Applix. But I wanted to just try and bridge the gap for some of you some of you who are, are very technical in the in the TM1 world and, and see where your skills can be cross-referenced into into Anoplan. And I guess the message to take away here is that if you are proficient in TM1, it will be very simple for you to become proficient in Anoplan and you will gain a whole new sphere of, of benefits by, by doing that. I mean, my TM1 guys, in terms of our transition in the early days away from TM1, you know, ultimately day one, day two training course, day three, they were building models in Amazon. It's it's really that it's really that easy. Okay, so first definition I'd just like to talk about is cubes. Uh, so you'll all be familiar with the multidimensional nature of, of cubes. In Anaplan, we have the exact same concept, except we call it modules. So we talk multidimensional modules, but ultimately you have the ability to pivot those modules, uh, add as many uh, different intersections or, or uh, lists, dimensions to that as, as you wish. And you can chop and, and slice that in, in whatever way you, you wish. In TM1, dimensions and attributes. Okay, in Anaplan, we talk lists and properties. So pretty much the same functionality there. Properties are, are equivalent of, of attributes, currencies, uh, lookup functions, uh, unit prices, et cetera. Uh, very similar technology there, and the look and feel is, is, is one for one almost. Rules versus calculations. So whereas the first two are very similar to each other, I think this is the first one that, that differs quite a bit. And ultimately, we're, we're writing calculations in Anaplan, whereas in TM1, you had a cube and then you had a rule box whereby you would come in and you would say, for this line item, for this uh, intersection of data, I want to apply this calculation. And ultimately, I had all the good stuff around skip, check and feeders, which I needed to, to remember, which was ultimately, once you got the hang of it, it was fine. If you were technically capable of, of understanding what was in that kind of gray box of, of rules, you were quite comfortable, but ultimately for a business user to go in and, and see what's going on in those real boxes is is a bit of a minefield. Across in Anaplan, we're still writing calculations. I'm not going to to pretend as if some calculations aren't uh, aren't complex because all businesses are complex and you need complex calculations to be able to deal with those. But ultimately in Anaplan, you have a much different structured approach to the calculations. You can see here, we apply our, our calculations to line items and then they wrap around our, our lists. And ultimately I can see in a single view in Anaplan, all of the calculations for all of my modules and I can export that. So I have a massive audit trail of those calculations, which line item references, which other line item, and then Chris will come on to talk about some of the model maps within Anaplan that are automatically generated as we as we go through. 
TI processes. So I think this is my bugbear of, of TM1, to be totally honest. I, I hated the, the concept of, of turbo integrators, um, heavily coded. Obviously, it got better over the years with Performance Modeler. Uh, and I should say, a lot of you, uh, you'll recognize some of the screenshots, others maybe not, because maybe you're using different parts of, of Anaplan. So it's not necessarily representative of all TM1 landscapes, just indicative of, of my experience with it. Uh, but ultimately, within Anaplan, you have a, a much more user friendly, uh, business focused uh, mapping structure. UI for data imports, exports, and moving data uh, around the platform. Got log files, so no messing around with trying to find the log files and, and see what errors popped up or see who's uh, been into the system. Within an plan, I have a history function, a full audit trail on who's made a change to what cell, uh, what was the previous value, what was the new value, and then ultimately I can restore that model to a point in time uh, at any stage very simply by, by hitting the restore button. Configuration, again, I mentioned at the top, uh, a lot of this is done for us, uh, so no messing around with the TM1 configuration. Uh, Anaplan has a uh, manage models area where I can take copies of models, I can archive models, I can sync different models. So we have the concept of application lifecycle management where I can have a, a dev model, a test live a model and a live model, and I can progress data and progress changes uh, within those very easily. And then I can compare since I, I synced my last model, how many changes have been uh, have, have occurred, and how many of them do I want to bring forward to my uh, revision tags in my my uh, my production model? Okay, so very simplified version of application lifecycle management. No manual copying of of uh, configuration files or or anything like that. And then finally. Um, promise before I hand over to Chris, I think just the, the user experience in, in Anaplan is one single user experience where if I have finance connecting to ops, connecting to sales, the supply chain, we all look the same. We write the same calculations, we write the same modules, and all of the, the look and feel and the navigation of Anaplan is is a single point through our, our user experience. Whereas maybe in, in the TM1 world, we have to choose between, is it perspectives, is it web sheets, is it contributor, is it uh, planning analytics? And, and to be totally honest about it, some of the latest versions of planning analytics, although it still has kind of the back end functionality of architect and performance modeler, it looks good on the front end, but ultimately you still have the choice of, of all these different options. Whereas with Anaplan, we have a, a single unified user experience, which makes life easier for, for our users. Okay, enough for me. Uh, hopefully that was a, a relevant introduction to, to everyone on, on, on our background and, and some of the, the key differentiators, but also similarities between Team One and Anaplan. I'll pass over to Chris now, who can hopefully bring that a bit more to life for us through uh, Anaplan for, for finance. Perfect. Thank you very much. Let me just bear in mind. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Okay, so yeah. the plan for the next... 35 minutes or so. Uh, we're going to start with that that user experience that Carl mentioned, um, show you some of the concepts. Um, as he mentioned, this is a, a demo model focused on, on finance, on fp and um, So we'll use this as the, uh, the benchmark. Um, but this same application, um, I've got example models here, everything from uh, sales planning, performance uh, incentive planning, uh, it could be supply chain, demand, it's all built on the, the same platform. Um, in terms of what we're looking at, so this is the, the user experience, this is a, a dashboard. They're completely self-service, so you as an end user can choose how you want to arrange them, what grids of data you want to put on there, components like charts, KPIs, etc., and you design them in a way that is going to be most uh, beneficial, should we say, to your users. Those users would log into the platform, uh, as Carl mentioned, completely cloud-based, so as long as they have internet, they can get to the platform, and there's an app as well if they want to use their, their mobile phone or, or iPad, et cetera, to access the application. And then crucially, the whole thing will be filtered down for security. First, you can choose which dashboards people have access to. If I flip into the, the contents of this model, you can see it has everything from kind of tops down planning, bottoms up planning, reviews, monthly analytics you might want to do on currency or, or variances. You haven't got to make every dashboard available to, to every user. You can choose who has access to what, even have them be sent emails with a link that will take them straight into the, the dashboard when you want them to. And then within the dashboards, they're filtered down based on security attached to the lists. So the list that you see here, similar to the, the hierarchy function in TM1, here we have countries rolling up into to continents. Firstly, for me, where I have full access, I can obviously use this list 
and say show me the entire dashboard but for Europe for example if you look closely you'll see all the different components updated if I flip it to, to North America same idea this one dashboard being sliced across the hierarchies but equally it means you can actually set security against them as well so if someone's just in charge of the the UK they would open up this dashboard and it would default to the the UK country here someone else would open up the exact same dashboard at the same time but their security may limit them so they just see France for example security does go further down down to individual cells if you want to set it that low but hierarchies or these lists being the main way that you would set it just a, a few concepts on the the dashboards before I go through a, a few examples so the first one being the obviously the slice board across these lists here we have the countries we have different time frames and importantly different scenarios or versions so if I want to see it just for the actuals for example or a forecast or as many budgets and scenarios as I want to create I can slice through again with security permitting but each of these components is pulling from that underlying uh, model or set of modules as Carl mentioned so we break out plan down into smaller components this grid here for example revenue planning doesn't uh, isn't just limited by the, the list that we have at the top here this one actually goes further down into an individual city and to an individual product for example so you can choose which lists apply to the data wherever you are in the system when we get forward and we look at things like uh, personnel planning so planning out costs that will go down to individual employees you might have fixed asset planning goes right down to individual assets and you can choose the level that not only you report on but also that you enter data in as well um, core concepts here if I just actually use this as a, a data entry dashboard so not only being used for for reporting analysis but actually for people to key in their their data and if I change January for example you'll see that sync through firstly this dashboard so down to this grid and net income you can see how it's changed my chart here that change is actually rippled through the entire model so everything is linked everything is synced I could be an individual cost center manager changing a number of units um, that relate to me and then immediately that can flow through to summary p ls balance sheets cash flows any kpis that you might have such as down in the bottom right here the changes that you make sync through instantly um, that's obviously subject to workflow which i can touch on so if you want to have approval steps you can do but really this idea if you change a number it flows all the way through the system allows you to do some really powerful things things like scenario planning you know what if this event happens i can create a new scenario change a number and see the impact instantly which we'll see at the end. Um, incidentally, the, the audit that Carl mentioned as well, if I look at the, the history of this cell, I can see exactly who changed it, when they changed it, and what they changed it to as well. So down to a cell by cell level, having that full history of what values have changed to. Okay, so they're really the, the core concepts. I'll touch on the calculations a little bit later on. We'll start with the, the user experience, and then when we get a bit further through, I'll jump into the modeling side. We'll actually build out some calculations, put those onto a, a dashboard. So you'll see how the, the workings work below the, the surface level experience. But for now, let's step through a few of the, the dashboards just to give you some examples. We're going to start with tops down planning. So in the idea here, we're setting a target that then our bottoms up cost centers have to, to stay within or they'll have exceptions to, uh, to face or add commentary against. Uh, Anaplan is great at allowing you to enter data at a very high level and then choose how you want to allocate that down your lists. So starting off here, for example, we're setting a high level revenue target. I can set a percentage growth on last year based on uh, a percentage. So for Europe, I could say actually it's going to be a 5% a uplift. That's automatically flowed down to the countries within Europe. So here we have the UK, France, Germany sitting within Europe, the 5% coming through. Incidentally, in terms of the, the actuals, the source data, and a plan is completely agnostic of source system. So be it different GL systems, ERP systems, if you have many, we can import from, from all of them and map them. But likewise, when you think about things like a CRM system, an HR system, um, we can pull in that data either via a, a CSV file or directly into those systems if needed as well. So you can have automatic refresh. Once you have those actuals, we're using those to apply our percentage growth to that gives us our our starting point so by country we've now got our high level revenue target but then allowing the user just by exception to make some edits and changes to it so here for example if I want to override the the allocated France number and say what if that was a hundred thousand then you'll see we get that uh, uplift on France um, and then it's reallocated 
across the other countries here. Uh, this could go further, this could go from the UK down into those cities, down into products and use this allocation down overrides um, to give you that piece. Uh, in our case, we stop at the country level and instead switch to a, an OPEX target based on that revenue plan that goes down to individual cost centers. So you'll see here we have this idea of a revenue driven target. This is coming from that previous dashboard where we set a revenue target and then allocating across our OPEX categories based on, on that history again. So a lot of what you'll see as we move through the, the demonstration is Anaplan taking those, those actuals, taking that historical data that you already have and using that to give you a, a starting point. So then all the end users have to do is just amend it by exception using the, the dashboards that we're moving through. In this case, for example, if I choose my, my GNA category, I've got my prior year, I've got my revenue driven target for the, the new year. And here, rather than automatically allocating it based on, on last year, for example, I've given myself a, a choice of different allocation methods. So here, if I want to base on prior year, I can do, and we can see our spread down to individual cost centers based on prior year spend. If I choose to base it on FTE, for example, I can do on a custom profile. But again, these are just examples. If you want to base it on effectively any data you have in the system, be it uh, custom metrics that you have, things like revenue or cost profiles, um, you can build those into the system and choose that as the, the method for allocation. This also works incidentally if you want to do allocations of, of costs like IT costs or central costs and allocate them across the business to understand things like true profitability. You can use this idea of an allocation method, spread it down into the detail, and obviously again, still have the ability to override uh, where you need to, in this case, down at the cost center level. Okay, so that's top-down planning from a kind of assumption-based with overrides. Um, you'll see later on the idea of just entering a, you know, a top figure sales number and seeing how that can automatically spread back through the business as well. Uh, in this particular model, this high level OPEX target is what we're then making available to the individual cost center owners when they start to do their, their bottoms up plan. So you'll see now my list goes down below the UK into London and then down to individual cost centers that sit within that office. We can see our target. So this has come through from that tops down planning that we just did. And here we're now allowing those end users to build up a detailed OPEX plan from the bottom up. So this could be Excel style templates if they just want a grid to key into, it could be driver based, could be attribute based planning, any logic that you can that you can think of or that you may have done in TM1, you can obviously bring that logic through into to Anaplan and then present it through the, the user experience that we're gonna see. Uh, if I start with a simple one, so I'll start with R&D, just a basic level. So this is the idea of just giving someone a, a grid of data. So an individual cost center, again, if you picture security is filtering down the, the list here. So if I'm in charge of the finance department, I would just see finance and I can go in, I can change any sales that I want to. That audit log is still tracking every change that I make. Or here, if I want to, I can choose to enter in at the, the full year level. So total year for research, if I change that to 60,000, this is gonna automatically reallocate back through the periods based on that existing data. So rather than on the previous screen where we saw the idea of choosing an allocation method and basing it on FTE or history, the breakback function will automatically base it on the data that exists. Uh, incidentally, not only can I do that at the, the total year level, if I wanted to do the total R&D costs across that full year and change my total here, I can make that change as well. And we'll see later on how these changes that I'm making are not only updating the finance department, they're not only updating total company for R&D that we see here, but they're also flowing these R&D costs through into the P&L, other statements and updating any kind of KPIs or covenants that might be attached to those. Uh, incidentally, on the workflow front, you'll see here we have the idea of submission with comments. This is specific not only to task, so I can submit my R&D budget when I'm finished, when I may not have finished my, uh, my personnel budget, for example, and obviously against each cost center. So you can then start to track where different cost centers are in the in the process, have they started work, have they submitted it, has it been approved yet? And you have that full tracking of data as well. Making things a little bit more uh, logic-based, if we look to something like the GNA costs instead, this is taking again the idea of last year's data and applying an adjustment to it, but this time we're then allocating that back into periods based on a selection. So rather than by default allocating that back through based on something like prior year, so any seasonality that we had last year is retained, here I could choose my profile, choose flat, for example, in which case my initial, initial budget here is even across the 12 months. 
I could choose to spread it based on something like 445, it could be FTE. And importantly, where you have this idea of connected planning that Carl mentioned, means that if you have a personnel planning module, if someone's planning personnel additions and they're saying we're going to add two new FTEs in August, that will automatically sync through to these allocations that you want to make as well. In my case, I'm going to base it on prior year. And then again, you can see we have our initial starting point, but with the ability to adjust. So if I want to make a change here in March and say it's going to be 15,000 in March, a really simple data entry for the end users to do. As I mentioned before, if they're just on their, their phone or iPad, they can access exactly the same concept. It will map correctly to whatever screen they're on. It makes it really easy to, to enter their data. And importantly, not only the, the numbers, but any commentary attached as well. So you'll see just on this one dashboard, we've got three different levels of commentary. I can enter an explanation here against the row as to why I'm doing a, an increase on, on last year, for example, for utilities. So I can say it's due to X, Y, Z. Um, you'll see here instantly that has cleaned up my exceptions. I've now explained why I'm having an increase on, on last year. We can do a, a comment on a, an individual cell and then a comment against the overall dashboard as we submit it as part of the workflow as well. And just like the numbers, if I slice through to a different cost center here, all of that text stays with it. So obviously each user not only entering in their, their values, but being able to enter in their, their commentary to go alongside as well. And that will stay with the data. So if you're reviewing your budget in six months time, maybe, maybe you've got some variances that have come in, you can still see that commentary attached to the cells, see the explanation for, for any changes that were made. Also means you can start to track the idea of, you know, that automated budget that was created from last year's data, could even be something like statistical forecasting, and then the additions, you'll see these two sets of data are held separately. So you can start to look at actually what value add did those budget holders make by going in and editing that data, or are there other parts of the business that are worth spending more time on um, versus something like GNA that may be more static as you move through time. Okay, so I won't go through many more. I'm just going to jump into the, the personnel one because this is the one we're going to do a bit of build from scratch on so you get to see the, the calculations behind the, the dashboards here. This is one that's been been finished, the idea being that we load in employees and their attributes, so obviously their salary, pension scheme, health plan, those kind of details, and then by each person, we get a detailed set of costs out the back, so based on when they joined, when they leave, uh, based on their salary, et cetera, those assumptions, we get a detailed set of employee costs uh, calculated, so I can just make an edit to a person, maybe say this person leaves at a certain point in time, if I say this person's going to leave in April, for example, we'll see that the cost will stop in, in April. Um, so this is what we're working towards. This is then obviously going to feed through into our, our total personnel cost, through into our, our p and um, But I have an example here that is partially built um, that we can finish off and you get to see how modules are created, how the, the logic is written as well. So here I've done the, the first bit. We have the idea of a module where we can import from an HR system. Uh, the employees and their attributes. Um, again, it's done across a list. So we have the IT department with their employees versus finance, for example, with their employees. Uh, we've also got a module here that is the cost of, of different health plans, for example. So rather than having a cost per individual, all we do is say that John is on the, the silver plan and we know that silver plan is, is 70 pounds a month in this case. So the bit we're gonna create is actually the calculation engine that says take these attributes and turn them into the, the values. So for that, we jump out of the, the user experience into the model building experience. This is incidentally where you'd also do things like set security against different users, create as many versions or scenarios that you want to create, as well as controlling the lists. So this structure here shows those employees rolling up into different cost centers. Same with the health plans, we have a list of health plans, bronze, silver, gold, um, we actually have a list of countries as well that's related to, uh, to taxes. If I wanted to create new lists, I can do so in here. If I want to add something new into a list, I can do that really easily here as well. What we're going to do though, if I come into here, is take these attributes that we've got here. So by employee, we added in these attributes. And this is what's called a, a module. So we said for this module, it's across versions. So I can have different employees that do different versions, different forecasts and we've got our employee list and then our line items, effectively the measures that go across our columns. We have another module here, which is our health plan. So this is just by the health plan, the bronze, silver, gold, and the line items just being the, the monthly cost. 
and we've got our tax assumptions where by country we're just doing a really simple percentage that's going to be our, our tax rate. This one, for example, being by country. So the way these modules work, whenever the, the dimensionality effectively or the list structure is different, you can have a new module just for that particular use. So whereas this one goes down to employee level, this one's by health plan and this one is by uh, by tax percentage, for example. So to build the calculations, we're going to go into our, our modules that we have. These are the three that we can see, plus one for images. So you want to have a logo or people's faces on the dashboard as you go through the employee plan, then you can uh, you can do so. I'm going to create a new one. I'll call it employee costs. And this is where we pick the kind of dimensionality against this module. So I want it to be by versions. So again, we can have the results for the budget versus the forecast versus any what scenarios. We've got time this time, so we actually want to see our costs across the periods, so across the budget here, and we'll have our employees. So obviously we can see the cost down to an employee level. If I just chose it at organization level, we'd be able to see the costs by cost center. Um, but in my case, I'll go down to employees and it will roll up through the cost centers. The line items then what we're calculating. So firstly, we're going to work out if they're actually active. So if they employed in this particular period, we'll look at things like their salary cost, uh, variable pay, maybe their pension, tax, we'll do health plan, and obviously total employee costs, for example. So it's as easy as that to create a new module. Just put a capsule on, on health as a perfectionist. Um, and these are our metrics. So by default, everything is input. I could actually go in and start typing in numbers here if I wanted to. Um, but what we then do is we jump into the the blueprint view and start to configure it. So this is where we choose any attributes against these line items, uh, apply any logic or formulas that we want to create as well. The first step of which is choosing the format. So the formats could be anything from different numbers, Boolean being a, a tick box, so yes or no. So in our case for active, we want it to be a, a yes or no. Are they employed or not? Uh, you'll see here we've also got things like uh, picking from a list or a predefined set of actions. That's why you say of items, uh, picking a time period, a date field, for example, um, that you can select. Uh, in my case, I'm then gonna make all of these formulas. We don't want people typing in costs against the individual employees. We're gonna calculate them all from our attributes that we had here. So as Carl mentioned, all of the, the logic is Excel style logic. Um, it's There's a full anapedia that goes into the, the details behind each one. Um, the first one, probably the, the most complex one we're gonna do, is the idea of working out if someone is actually active. So the way to do that um, is to bring up the formula box um, and then we just click around the model to reference the line items that we want to use here. So if I go into my employee attributes, I can say, right, so is the start date of the employee less than the end of the current month? And this end function, if you ever use things like today in Excel, it's that same concept, end is the end of the, the current month. And is the end date of the employee greater than the start of the current month. So basically, are they employed in the months that we're, we're looking at? And you can see that formula is now referenced. As data changes here, if people change start dates and end dates, that will sync through to my, my module. For salary is an if statement. So in Anaplan, what they've done is they've made all the language plain English. So if I say, if it's active, so if they're employed, then take the salary, which is here, and we'll divide that by 12, else zero. So that's our logic that we're working with. You'll see it's a plain English statement. If it's active, then do this, else do this. What Anapan's actually done though is they've made conversions. So where that slightly different syntax to Excel, if you want to, you can actually use the Excel syntax even with the equal sign and say if, well, let me just pop it back up here. So if I say if, uh, open brackets active, then take, the variable pay in this case, divided by 12, comma zero for the else zero. So you'll notice the exact same syntax that you use in Excel, that actually converts it again for you into the Anaplan syntax. So that learning curve of moving from Excel into Anaplan becomes really small. Uh, pension, just quickly, I'll do salary times by that particular employee's pension percentage. And then tax, for example, we're gonna take the salary plus the variable pay and times those by 
our tax percentage, but you'll see here the tax is attached to a country. So this is where our lookup comes in. So just like a V lookup or an H lookup that you might do in Excel, we can do a lookup again on an attribute. So a lookup against the country of the employee and we build up our costs. And then health plan, same idea finally. I'm going to go to my health plan cost, take the monthly cost here, and then do a lookup against the health plan that we've chosen for each individual person. So also I've gone fairly quick there. I actually need a, an if statement here for if they're active. But hopefully you can see there's no scripting, no coding. Uh, it's all just clicking around the model and then Excel style syntax. And then the final one here, the total, I just have to add these ones together and we get our total. So if I go back into this grid here, you can see all of that logic. So the salary divided by 12, the variable pay divided by 12, pension scheme, taxes, health plans, and then our, our total that's been pulled through here. So say no scripting, no coding, just Excel style logic to build up this. And obviously these are now sliced across our lists. So I can do the same thing for Jane. I can look at Alex, for example. I could even do a pivot here and put my employees down here. And we can see all of those calculations that have taken hold against those line items. The very final step, just to put those onto a dashboard, so just to show how this piece works, you design it, you add a grid. In this case, I'm going to choose that employee cost grid that I just made. So the UX, the user experience, just links through to the underlying workings. Choose if I want to do any filters or show and hide certain rows. In my case, I'm just not going to bother showing the, the active line. That's a working that I used. And that's now on the, the dashboard. And what you'll see that automatically it's context specific. So if I click on Jane, this updates to Jane. If I click on Alex, it updates to Alex and it will sync automatically. So if I say that Alex stops working in, let's say, end of August, our costs will stop in August. If I change their salary to 100, then the salary updates, all those driver-based calculations will update as well. So I can now, as an end user, just change people's attributes by exception, and all of my calculations are going to happen down to the individual person by period based on that logic. And incidentally as well, roll up into total company, and then total company employee cost is now this line here, for example. So really easy to do. Uh, simple logic, obviously a simple example. You might have steps in tax rates or more things to work out, but the, uh, the concept would be the same. Okay, so let me flip back to, to where we were. So if you have the idea that we've completed our, our bottoms up budget, we've gone through our different templates, there's driver based examples, the idea of entering data below the GL code so you're not tied to the, the GL codes that you have in your source system, for example, and our plan's a lot more agile, you can build in structures how you, how you want to. Um, but if you imagine we go through our, our cost center plan, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about how that rolls up and then how you can do a, a scenario plan off the back as well. So if I go into my reporting side of this particular app, look at my reporting summary here, obviously summed up to quarters in very high level categories. You can see we have the income statement, balance sheet report and cash flow statement. And importantly, any changes I've been making throughout the demo have already been syncing through into here. As I mentioned before, you can use the workflow to, to stop that. So only if it's been approved, do you want it to flow through into the final statements or you can have it where everything syncs through instantly. So what this means, if I open up the income statement as an example, where we have something like our R&D costs across the year, you can see in January, we've got 366. I could open up the R&D template as an individual cost center owner, change this to something crazy, like a million pounds. And then if I flip back into my income statement, you can see that million pounds has come through for January, rolled up to the UK and the rest of the, the structures here. So just those simple formulas like we saw in the personal example, this just pulls through from the R&D line, but it gives you that instant feedback on any changes. Um, taking that one step further into the idea of doing that across different scenarios and answering different what if questions, if I just jump into a, a different report that's now been pivoted, so we now have our versions across our columns, um, the budget that we have here is syncing through again. So if I pick January here in my list, this has our million pounds for R&D that I just entered. You'll see here, we've got a scenario uh, against it here. So uh, everyone's doing their bottom up plan against the budget. There's people key in their numbers, it's rolling up through into our budget. Um, perhaps I want to just have kind of a sand pit, a play around and say actually what would be the case 
what would be the results if, if X, Y, or Z happened. So for that, we add a new scenario. Um, that's something done through the, the model building side. So if I jump back into the, the model building side that we ran a second ago for this FPNA model, we can see our, our versions. So we've got our budget, we've got our what if. If I want to create a few more scenarios, I can do that in here as well and create budget scenario Y and Z, for example. But we already have our scenario. So all I need to do here is actually do a, a copy. So what I want to do is take everything from the budget and copy it into my budget scenario X just to give me that starting point. You can see where I am currently, where I've made some changes, I've got some differences. So for that, we have a tool that's called bulk copy. And this allows you basically to take all the data from one place, in my case, the budget, and copy it to another. And you'll see the power of Anaplan. This copy copies a, a couple million cells in about a second. And not only is that copied the data at this high level, down on the individual templates, it's copied every single cell change, every employee change, every comment that I put in against the budget. I now have an identical version um, that I can now look to, uh, to plan against. So I could either potentially have the end users fill out that data. So if I go right down to an individual template, let's this time do something like a revenue template. And I can actually say, right, for one product, for one city in this case, let me change the number of units. And perhaps I'm asking people to do like a best case, worst case, expected case scenario. Then when I jump back, oh, we should see the results here against the full year. So I can see how it's updated across my scenario X and therefore give me a variance between the two. And I can see the impact of that change in units or I can use it to answer a very specific question. So if I pull out my salary drivers here, for example, and say, actually, what if the national insurance percentage for the UK went up to 15%, we can immediately see the impact that would have. So we'd end up spending about 34,000 pounds more on salaries and benefits due to that change. So say either a broad best case, worst case, expected case type budget that you roll out from the bottom up, or to answer very specific questions. You can see how quick it is to, uh, to create those scenarios have a variance between them and then see that impact as well. Um, just finally to finish off in terms of using these dashboards for more of a kind of reporting analytics side. So obviously all the dashboards we've seen so far, they double up as both data entry and for reporting purposes. Other examples in here include analysis on things like month to month variances. You'll see here we have the button to request input. So I can automatically send out emails to a whole group of users. In this case, me and my colleague asking for them to review this particular set of variances, enter their data or their reasons why, and then submit that back to me. Um, that can all be done through here, as well as things like drill downs down into individual transactions. So these dashboards, these uh, these screens in the user experience can be used across the entire process, as well as obviously being able to take the data, feed it into other systems. If you want to feed it back into the RP system, for example, as, as uh, thresholds, or we have add-ins into the, the office suite as well. Okay, so that was a, a pretty quick uh, run through. Also, is there any questions? There is a question pane um, that you can use as well. Um, otherwise, for now, I'll, I'll hand back to Carl. Great, thanks, Chris. So, a couple of final thoughts from from my side, guys, and then I've got a couple of questions from the chat pane that I'll um, that I'll try and cover. I won't get to them all, but um, I'll try and tackle some of the common teams and then we'll follow up on, on any outstanding items. And then Chris, if there's any burning ones on, on your side, feel free to call them out and I'll try and tackle them. I guess, uh, Chris, thanks for that demonstration. Um, obviously, we're, we've only got limited time to show you the, the depth and breadth of Anaplan for, for finance, but hopefully that's given you a, a good picture of, of the art of the possible and, and how you might transition your your skills and team one across to to Anaplan. Obviously that was very focused around finance and uh, we wanted to do that because a lot of um, the team one use cases we see are within finance but do remember that one of the enablers within Anaplan is that we're not just limited to finance. A lot of our first lands do typ typically be in finance for budgeting, forecasting, traditional FP&A uh, but we very quickly have the ability to scale across the organization into sales, into supply chain, into human resources. So if we had all day with Chris, Chris could pull out similar demonstrations across what we call our, our core 18 honeycomb. Uh, so you can see here just some of the different use cases in, in finance, sales, supply chain and, and human resources. And actually, um, if we actually drill down on some of these particular use cases like sales and operations planning, 
and we also have multiple use cases within within those as well. So really, if, if you're struggling with a, a use case, if you're struggling with a business process, you're using TM1 within finance, but Excel within other processes, and a plan is, is capable of, of killing all of those processes for you in a single uh, unified platform. Okay, um, I can see a couple of questions come through, so I'll cover, I've got three here. So first one seems to be around data integration. There's a few questions on that. So what are the options for data integration with Anaplan? Um, okay, so there's three options. So typically, I guess, coming from TM1, you would be familiar with um, turbo integrator processes, either from CSV or, or through ODBC connections. So Anaplan has three kind of integration strategies. The first one is a very simple uh, UI for imports and exports. And maybe that's from a, a CSV or text file and buttons that we, we create on the, on the UA, UI. So that's kind of option number one, which is the kind of very simplified import export function. Um, which which has got that kind of nice look and feel to it I showed earlier on one of the screenshots. Second option is for any open source uh, upstream or downstream uh, connection, um, i.e. where you can get an ODBC to, um, Anaplan has a tool called Anaplan Connect, which is a batch technology. And instead of ODBC, it just uses uh, Java, uh, JDBC. Uh, so ultimately, in the same way, you might connect your, your Turbo integrators uh, to, to upstream or downstream sources. You can do the same here with Alpine Connect for open sources, uh, except a lot of the, you know, you're, you're not writing heavy code for each of those TIs. Uh, you're writing simple SQL, and then you're able to use the Alpine UI to, to bring that to life. And then the third strategy is for more of the closed source technologies, maybe like a Salesforce, um, or any of the cloud-based ERPs, uh, Anaplan has uh, local connectors with all of the best of breeds uh, ETL tools like Informatica Cloud, uh, Boomi, MuleSoft, SnapLogic. So if you have any internal strategy around those guys, uh, then, then there are Anaplan connectors within them. Um, Anaplan strategy themselves is, is Informatica Cloud. There's a local Anaplan HyperConnect tool within that that can that can, uh, can be leveraged very very easily. So those three options are are your best approach. Okay, uh, is there any need for an equivalent of skip check and feeders in Alplan? Oh God. Um, so uh, this is a deep, deep technical question. Um, so answer is no. Um, so some of you may not know what a skip check or feeder is. I won't go into the detail of it, but it was the vein of, of my life when I was building TM1 models. Answer is no with Alplan. Um, it's already done for you. So when you write a calculation, like the calculations that uh, Chris wrote earlier for the employee costs, Anaplan only recalculates downstream affected cells by default. So the technology is set up to, to, to ultimately work in the same way as, as you would have wished with skip check and feeders, uh, but you don't need to do anything about it. It's, it's uh, the hyperblock technology is, is efficient enough to, to do that for you. Follow up to that question was, how does Anaplan recalculate and are all cubes connected? Uh, how does Anaplan recalculate? So um, very different to, to TM1. So a lot of you will be familiar maybe with the recalculate button within some of the old web sheets or, or perspectives or, or even in TM1 architect, whereby if a number changed in my in my employee assumptions, I had to recalculate my employee costs and had to physically press a button to, to recalculate it. Uh, Anaplan is live. So you saw through um, Chris's demonstration, if I make a change to my R&D costs, I can immediately see the impact it has downstream in my P&L or in my, in my clash flow. So, you know, there is no real uh, recalculate function with an animal plan. It's, it's all linked live. Now, he did make the good point around workflow and process and, and notifications. So, uh, you may not want a change in your R&D to immediately impact the P&L. So, therefore, you might create a workflow or notification process uh, to disconnect those those processes and only feed through to the uh, P&L when you've actually got approval, uh, maybe by a cost center owner or regional head or, or whatever it might be. So, it's very possible to... Um, to, to set up those processes so that not everything is is um, linking live. So with great power uh, comes great responsibility. Okay, Chris, are you, any other common themes we, on the question side? It's cool. One new one just came in around uh, workforce planning. So uh, firstly, is workforce planning data accessible from any HR slash payroll system? Um, so the short answer is is yes. Basically, we're agnostic in terms of source data. Uh, which of those three methods that Carl just laid out uh, you'd pick would obviously come down to how frequently you want that data refreshed. If it's you know once a month for a budget, then CSV is normally the, the simplest way. If you want it you know, daily, weekly refreshes, then maybe we do the, the direct link. We can actually get to 
to any of them. Um, and then how do you limit the viewing on confidential info such as salaries? Um, so there's basically security. So by user, you set what security they have over the, the list. So do you actually want them to go down to individual employees or perhaps someone can see it at the, the cost center level or can they not see those GL codes at all? Um, you can set it at the list level and then go down even further to individual cells. So if you wanted to have someone that can, I don't know, set the company car details against an employee but not see their salary, um, you can do that kind of logic as well. Okay, good stuff, uh, Chris. If there's any more questions that come in, uh, we'll we'll take them offline and we'll um, we'll go back to the to you guys directly. I guess obviously uh, there's a lot to cover there in 60 minutes. Hopefully it's it's kind of whetted the appetite into the art of the possible. But uh, if it, if there's any specific questions around your current TM1 environment or or um, how you might look at migrating either from TM1 or from anything else uh, to Anapan, please do feel free to to reach out. Um, either to to me or Chris directly, or to our, our info at beverconsulting.com uh, emails. We'd be very very happy to to just have a, a deeper chat on on any areas you're struggling with or, or just questioning. Can they can they can they work? And I guess the the thing I'd leave you with, hopefully, uh, I said at the top of the session, this wouldn't be a bashing session session on TM1. You know, I spent many fond years working with TM1. Uh, well, fond is probably generous, but uh, in the in the early years of my uh, EPM consultancy. Uh, but you know, the message from from my side is technology has moved on, uh, the world has moved on, and and Alton is just a lot more uh, fun, let's say, than than the old days of of TM1. Um, so hopefully you've you've been able to take that away from from our session today. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a, a great rest of the day, and feel free to to get in contact if you have any deeper questions. Thank you.